Today we are looking at the central dogma, which also involves DNA replication, transcription, translation, briefly the other videos I made previously on them. So, all living things are made up of four classes of large biological molecules, such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So, definition of a macromolecule are large molecules which are complex. So large biological molecules have unique properties that arise from the orderly arrangement of the atoms. <clears throat> so, a polymer is defined as a long molecule consisting of many similar building blocks. The repeated units that serve as building blocks are called monomers. So examples of polymers are carbohydrates, proteins and nucleic acids. Sugars, amino acids and nucleotides are the building blocks and a huge variety of polymers can be built from a small set of monomers. So there are two types of nucleic acids, DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, and ribonucleic acid, which is RNA. So DNA provides direction for its own replication. It directs the synthesis of mRNA, known as messenger RNA, and through mRNA controls protein synthesis. This whole process is called gene expression. <coughs> so each gene along the DNA molecule directs the synthesis of a messenger RNA. mRNA molecule interacts with the cell's protein synthesizing machinery to direct the production of a polypeptide. The flow of genetic information can be summarized as DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. This is known as essential dogma. So nucleic acids are polymers called polynucleotides. Each polynucleotide is made up of monomers called nucleotides. And each nucleotide is made up of a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, and one or more phosphorus groups. The portion of a nucleotide without the phosphate group is known as a nucleoside. So, as you mentioned about the sugar, it can be either deoxyribose or ribose. So, deoxyribose sugars are five carbon chains, and we label these carbons one to five. Deoxyribose sugars differ from ribose sugars because they are at the free carbon. And you must take, please note that the free end and the five end carbons, very important for these. So DNA molecules have two polynucleotides spiraling around an imaginary axis forming a double helix. The backbones run in opposite five end to three end directions from each other and arrangement referred to as anti-parallel. Nitrogenous bases in one polynucleotide stand form hydrogen bonds with the nitrogenous bases in the other polynucleotide stand. So one DNA molecule can contain many genes. So they create acid pairing, only certain bases in DNA pair up and form hydrogen bonds. So adenine pairs of thymine and guanine pairs of cytosine. And this is known as a process called complementary base pairing. This feature of DNA makes it possible to generate two identical copies of each DNA molecule and a cell preparing to divide. So look at hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds form when a hydrogen atom covalently bonded to one electronegative atom is also attached to another electronegative atom. And living cells that electronegative atom partners are usually optional nitrogen atoms. The phosphate group binds the ribose sugars together into the sugar phosphate backbone, and these are very strong, and these are known as phosphodiester bonds. So the bases involved, adamine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, these are known as purines or pyrimidines. So the rule is, is a purine always pairs with a pyrimidine via a weak hydrogen bond. So adenine is your purine and cytosine is your thymine and adenine pairs of thymine which is your pyrimidine and cytosine pairs of guanine and guanine is your pyrimidine. <coughs> no sorry, adenine and guanine are your uh, purines. So think of your structures. Adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, cytosine, guanine, thymine, adenine. And if you can see here, so think of it as like a ladder. That is then twisted to the form a double helix, you can see here. So, DNA is usually much longer than cell in which it resides. Prokaryotic DNA can become coiled or supercoiled, but eukaryotic DNA has a special feature where it is coiled around histone proteins, which collectively coil into nucleosomes and then into chromosomes. These wind and unwind in response to DNA replication via an enzyme known as topoisomerase. So DNA replication is one of the most basic processes of a cell. It is the process by which a double-stranded DNA molecule is replicated to form two new double-stranded DNA molecules. 
Each time a cell divides, the two new daughter cells must have the same amount of DNA as the parent cell. To do that, each strand of the parent DNA acts as a template for replication. There are three major steps in DNA replication. The opening of the double helix and separation of the DNA strands, the priming of the DNA strands and the assembly of the new DNA molecule. So during the application, the DNA unwinds at a specific location called the origin. This is a two-step process. An initiator protein unwinds a short stretch of the double helix. An enzyme called helicase then binds and breaks the bonds between the bases, separating the two DNA strands. As the helicase unwinds the DNA, another enzyme primase binds to an unwound strand and builds a short stretch of nucleotides known as a primer. And this is the point where DNA replication begins. Once the primer is assembled, DNA polymerase attaches to the strand where the primer is. So DNA polymerase is classified as an enzyme that attaches new nucleotides to the exposed nitrogenous bases and building a new strand. As the DNA polymerase makes its way down the DNA strand, it relies on a pool of free floating nucleotides to build a new strand. So the nucleotides are always paired with their partner nucleotides, say for instance adenine with thymine, cytosine and guanine. And adenine and guanine are your purines, and cytosine and thymine are your pyrimidines. And this is known as complementary base pairing. <coughs> so it's a very quick process DNA replication. For example, the bacteria E. coli can add 1000 nucleotides per second and humans can add 50 nucleotides per second. So the reason it's so quick is because multiple polymerases can synthesize new DNA strands from both original strands. Double stranded -strand DNA is anti parallel, so the two strands are replicated differently. So you see here, 5N to 3N phosphate group and 3N to 5N hydroxyl group. So let's look at this concept of ligand and lagging strands. So DNA polymerase can only add nucleotides to the free end of a DNA strand. The leading strand can be replicated continuously because the free end of a new strand is the free end. So DNA polymerase follows helicase along the strand, adding new nucleotides to, to build a new DNA. So that was the leading strand, now look at the lagging strand. In order to replicate the lagging strand, DNA polymerase needs to lead it 3 to 5, and so the lagging strands undergo replication discontinuously. Numerous RNA primers are made by primase and bind at various points along the lagging strand. So the lagging strand has to work backwards from replication thought, so it still adds nucleotides to the free end. So it needs to stop while helicase unwinds more of the DNA, meaning the lagging strand is replicated in small pieces of DNA called Okazaki fragments. These are joined together later by the enzyme ligase, so ligase joins the fragments together. <clears throat> so the central dogma is the concept that cells are governed by a cellular chain of command. So as I said, DNA goes to RNA to protein. DNA to RNA is transcription and RNA to protein is a process known as translation. The basic principles of transcription and translation is RNA is the bridge between genes and proteins for which they code. Transcription is the synthesis of RNA using information in the DNA. Transcription produces messenger RNA and translation is the synthesis of polypeptide using information in mRNA. And the site where translation occurs is known right as ribosomes. So here, here's a nice wee diagram. Transcription, RNA processing, nucleus, you can see here, the DNA to pmRNA is transcription, and the pmRNA going to mRNA is a process known as RNA processing, in which certain things can occur, like you're adding of the guanine cap, your poly tail, your splicing, and after that it goes to nucleus, and from here translation can occur in the uh, ribosomes. The molecular components of transcription and RNA polymerase is where it carries the RNA synthesis, which pries the DNA strands apart and joins the RNA nucleotides. The mRNA is complementary to the DNA template strand. RNA polymerase does not need any primer. However, there is something key here to know. RNA synthesis follows the same base pairs as DNA, such as adenine pairs of thymine and uh, guanine pairs of cytosine. So adenine being your purine and guanine being your purine pairs of pyrimidine. But the difference is, is that in mRNA, there is no thymine, there is uracil. So adenine pairs with uracil. 
The transcription is a very simple process of DNA replication. It also has three stages, initiation, elongation, and termination. So, when it's the start of transcription in a process known as initiation, promoters signal that transcription start point and usually extend does the nucleotides upstream of the start point. Transcription factors mediate the binding of RNA polymerase and the initiation of transcription. The completed assembly of transcription factors in RNA polymerase 2 bound to a promoter is called a transcription initiation complex. A promoter called a Tata box is crucial in forming the initiation complex of eukaryotes. So here in this diagram, you can see a eukaryotic promoter, which is Tata box. Several transcription factors bind to the DNA. And this is also for me sure transcription initiation complex. So moving on to the second stage of DNA transcription, which is elongation of the RNA strand. So as the RNA polymerase moves along the DNA, it untwists the double helix 10 to 20 bases at a time. Transcription progresses at a rate of 40 nucleotides per second in eukaryotes. So a gene can be transcribed simultaneously by several RNA polymerases. Nucleotides are added to the free end of the growing RNA molecule. I'm showing the elongation of the RNA strand and nucleotides being added. The final stage of DNA transcription is known as termination. So remember the first one is initiation and the second one is elongation. The methods of termination are different in bacteria and eukaryotes. In bacteria, the polymerase stops transcription at the end of the terminator and the mRNA can be translated without further modification. In eukaryotes, RNA polymerase 2 transcribes a polyadenylation signal sequence. The RNA transcript is at least 10 to 35 nucleotides past this polyadenylation sequence. So, as I mentioned previously about the RNA processing, enzymes in eukaryotic nucleus modify pre mRNA in a process known as RNA processing before the genetic messages are dispatched to the cytoplasm. During RNA processing, both ends of the primary transcript are altered. Also, in most cases, certain interior sections of the molecule are cut out and the remaining parts spliced together. So, you can see here the poly A tail, the 5N cap. So, each end of a player in the mRNA molecule is modified a particular way. So, you have the 5N receiving a guanine cap to a modified nucleotide 5 end and the 3 end gets a poly A tail. So, you can see the uh, list of A's here at the end. These are examples of RNA processing. So they have several functions, these modifications. They seem to facilitate the export of mRNA to the cytoplasm. They protect mRNA from hydrolytic enzymes and they help ribosomes attach to the five end. So that was five end guanine, methyl guanine capping and uh, poly A tail. Now let's look at RNA splicing. So most eukaryotic genes in the RNA transcripts have long non-coding stretches of nucleotides that are between coding regions. These non-coding regions are called intervening sequences or introns. The other regions are called exons because they are eventually expressed using translated, usually translated into amino acid sequences. So an intron is basically non-coding DNA and exons are coding DNA. RNA splicing removes introns and joins exons creating an mRNA molecule for continuous coding sequence. So you can see here, you have a 5N cap, intron, then you have an exon, then the intron, then the exon, and poly tail. So these introns are then cut out and the exons are spliced together. And this was finally what you get the 5N cap, then the exon, then the poly tail. So the introns are not coded. So some introns contain sequences that may deadly gene expression. Some genes can encode more than one chitin of polypeptide depending on what sediments are treated as exogenous splicing. This process is known as alternative RNA splicing. As a result, the number of different proteins in an organism can produce is much greater than its number of genes. Proteins often have a molecular architecture consisting of the discrete regions called domains. In many cases, different exons code for different domains in a protein. Exon shuffling can result in the evolution of new proteins. So that's the end of today's video. So if any of one of you have enjoyed this video and you want to look in more detail about DNA transcription, translation, replication, I do have previously videos made that if you look at my biochemistry playlist, they will show you about DNA mutations, transcription, translation, etc. And they're very good in that sense, you know, even if I do say so myself. And they have quite, quite a lot of detail to make this video. But anyway, thank you very much for tuning in today and I hope we see you in the next one. Thank you, bye-bye.